Welcome everybody to Wildlife Wednesday number four of fall 2021. So we're joining from different areas across Canada and possibly even the states and further away as well. Welcome. We're really glad that you're here. Normally I would be in Calgary, but today I'm joining you from Kelowna, BC. So in the spirit of reconciliation, I begin by acknowledging that the land that I'm gathering here on is the unceded territory of the Silix, the Okanagan peoples. We also want to acknowledge with gratitude that we live, play, and work upon the traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Siksaga, the Gainai, the Bagani, the Sutina, the Axi Nakoda Nations, and Métis Nation, Region Number 3. And to all people who make their homes in Treaty Region 7, or Treaty 7 Region of Southern Alberta, welcome. We're so happy to hear, have you here. Our hearts go out to everyone that is affected right now by some horrible events in Western Canada with the floods and storms that have happened and hopefully all of your friends and family and loved ones are safe right now. Uh, I know the situation is changing uh, moment by moment in some places and uh, so we just continue to, to have everyone in our hearts to hopefully have this resolved very, very shortly. So we're happy to have you here because this is intended to be a little escape from life, to hang out with a few people who have like-minded interests. And we will, uh, let me just see one moment here. Do you know what I did not do? I did not make Marissa my co-host. Therefore, Marissa cannot see it when people are coming into the waiting room. So we'll just, sorry, Marissa, I'll just do that. There we go. I'm still in training. Perfect. So wel welcome, everyone. Oh, and I Love Birds Company is here too. Wonderful. Good to see everybody. Uh, it's great. So we did just perform a land acknowledgement in case that you just missed that. I wanted you to know that that's very important to us. So we have acknowledged lands that we're on and visiting on. And very, very happy to have all of you here. And hearts go to anybody who are affected by the floods and by the impacts of the weather events that are happening. So Wildlife Wednesdays are brought to you entirely by volunteers, uh, including our speakers who come with no honorarium or payment of any kind very kindly donating their time to prepare, to create their presentations and spend this time with us, even preparing beforehand, like last night, having a trial run and then tonight uh, with all of us. Uh, very grateful for that, uh, that giving heart to be here and share your knowledge with us. It wouldn't be possible without the folks who are coordinating. And I am eternally grateful to Anne and to Marissa who are on our team with Calgary Migratory Species Response Team. And Anna and Marissa do all of the coordination and setting up all of our speakers. And Marissa even writes up a beautiful report that we love to you after. And, um, and we will, um, you'll see that in your inbox uh, not long after the event. Now, if you did happen to receive a, a shortcut Zoom as a, as a guest, a special guest of one of the, of the co-speakers, if we don't have your email address, make sure that we have that. Otherwise, we won't be able to get that, uh, that information sheet to you after. So without further ado, I am thrilled to introduce you, Julia Hynotsky, to our Wildlife Wednesday. So Julia was born in Calgary, Alberta. I know her as the really nice lady who comes and sits in my garage for long periods of time, scanning birds tirelessly, often with very cold feet, cold hands, and never a complaint uh, with her honorary garage office set up. And just enjoy working with you so much, Julia. So Julia was raised by hippie parents, surrounded by unruly house plants bookishness and art supplies with CBC radio playing softly constantly in the background sounds totally dreamy inevitably as a result Julia grew up to be an artist and we're so glad that you did a graduate of the Alberta University for the Arts her multidisciplinary practice includes digital and analog photography and seeks to ask questions and inspire curiosity about the complex relationships between humans and the natural world. 
Julia has completed artist residencies at the Beatty Biodiversity Museum in Vancouver, BC, a Kinship House, Balkan County, Alberta, and the Empire of Dirt, Creston, BC. I love that, the Empire of Dirt. You need to tell us more. Her work has been exhibited internationally and has been acquired by public and private collections, including the Alberta Foundation of the Arts and the Fairmount Bamp Springs Hotel. Julia's most recent adventure, supported by grads from the Calgary Arts Development Authority and the Alberta Foundation for the Arts, involved building a mobile natural history collection laboratory, a combination tiny camper and workspace, the Alfresco Science Machine and explore the many ecosystems of Western Canada, from Alberta's Riding on Stone Provincial Park to the Guayanas, is that how I say that? Guayanas National Park Reserve in British Columbia and Wood Buffalo National Park Northwest Territories. If Julia is not in her home studio working on something tiny, she's out in the forest working on something big. Julia, it is so great to have you. Thank you so much for being here and spending this time with us. And so just so everybody knows, we did ask Julia last night and, and, and yeah, clap, clap, clap. Thank you very much. And you actually have um, some little things you can play with at the bottom of your Zoom with reactions and feel free to, to applaud, put your hand up, ask questions, or put your heart up if you hear something that you're enjoying. And um, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna have, Julia has a presentation for us and you are welcome to ask questions throughout the presentation. We did check with Julia to see what she prefers and that is totally okay. And I was thinking too, that there might be an image or two where you're like, whoa, I need to see that again. If you could please stop and blow that one back up because it's pretty incredible. And then after, um, once all of our questions and answers are done, we're going to turn off the recording and we're going to invite you to stay for another 15 or 20 minutes and just have a casual, um, just a visit if you would like to, because we've, we have found that sometimes people like to stay after a little bit and we do want to give you the opportunity because in today's day, getting out and visiting is not so easy and it's a lot of fun to meet one another. So. In any event, without me chattering along any further, Julia, welcome. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I'm really excited to be here too. This is an exciting new project I've been working on, so happy to uh, share it with everyone. So uh, as Kathleen said, I have a presentation, so I will just uh, share my screen and get started. <clears throat> and while Julius is sharing that, just so you know, the comments that we have, you usually cannot copy and paste them. So if you see anybody sharing a link, including us or one of your co-guests out in uh, Zoom land there, I would recommend clicking on the link, opening it into a browser so that you don't lose that. Over to you. That's such a good point. Dude, like, look at the first one. Hi. What's that, Gary? Hi, Gary. Wow. Sorry, I'm um, you. <laughs> That's okay. I was excited. I thought we had our first question already. I'm sure they'll be coming soon. Okay. So, um, as Kathleen said, so my name is Julia Hynotsky. I'm a visual artist. I'm based uh, in Calgary, Alberta, but I work all over Western Canada. Um, oh, no, hang on, technical, there we go. Okay, uh, so I'm working with uh, themes like connections and ecosystems, biodiversity loss, and the complicated relationship between humans and nature. So tonight I'll just give you a bit of an overview of my practice and the kinds of projects that I've worked on. And then I'll get to the part that everyone's probably really most interested in, which is the ongoing project that I've been working on with uh, Calgary Migratory Species Response Team, uh, which is called Birding in the Anthropocene. So I'm going to go ahead and get started. So uh, I was really lucky as uh, to spend a lot of time outdoors as a kid growing up. 
uh, from exploring parks in Calgary to camping trips on the weekends, uh, spending summers at our little cabin by the lake. Um, my dad was an artist who really loved painting and photographing landscapes. And my mom, who is also in the audience tonight, is a very accomplished amateur botanist and student of natural history. So um, I really grew up surrounded by these places and ideas and practices. So that's little me and it pretty much looks just the same. If you went for a walk with me today, <laughs> I would look just the same. <clears throat> Uh, when it came time for me to go to university, I was really interested in biology and botany. So I took some first year science classes, but I have to tell you guys, I took grade 12 math uh, three or four times trying to get a mark high enough to get uh, into a science program. And I just never quite managed to get above maybe a 60. <laughs> so. Um, that was that for my hopes of, of being a scientist. And I actually, I, I had to look this up because I wanted to make sure I wasn't lying to you about it. And there's the evidence. Uh, let me draw your attention to unit two, which was especially a successful part of the program. <laughs> and I have to say, this was in continuing education where I was actually really applying myself, not just high school. Anyway, so, Fast forward from all those disappointing math marks, um, maybe a decade later, I got into art school. And uh, so I graduated with a degree in photography from ACAD, which is now Alberta University for the Arts. Um, and I've been pretty much working um, between commercial photography and fine art uh, ever since. So um, I think uh, in the end, it all kind of worked out because uh, working as an artist, you can still you, know, you can still explore all those themes that you're interested in, um, but from a bit of a different angle. So I can still um, study all those scientific ideas and uh, and knowledge about nature, um, but take take my own angle on things. Um, in my practice, I read so many things that were written by really talented uh, scientists and researchers and knowledge keepers. And so that um, really guides a lot of what I do. <clears throat> uh, so as an artist, I have the opportunity to be very deeply biased uh, about the things that I'm, that I'm sharing. So uh, as a scientist, there are of course necessarily conventions to be adhered to in describing your findings. Uh, there's a risk associated with speaking with great affection about the subjects of your research. Um, so I think there's a place for art in these conversations that we're having as a society about human impacts on the rest of the living world, because uh, making art that's informed by science and research can really help boost that message and translate it into a different form that uh, can be maybe understood uh, by by a different group of people or um, maybe just inspire people in a different way and have a have a positive impact um, coming from another angle. So these are just a few examples of some of the work that I've been doing uh, on the left. You see a piece, this is from a series of wet plate photographs that I created using plants. And wet plate is one of the oldest forms of photography. So you're pouring an emulsion onto a piece of glass or metal, and then it goes into a silver bath to sensitize it, and then right into a camera. And then you take the photo and develop it right away. Um, so I was doing all these really beautiful uh, botanical sort of documentation pieces using that process. Um, in the middle, there's uh, more of an installation piece. This is using a whole variety of seeds that I've collected, but they're painted with a really super flat matte black paint. So they almost appear like a hole in space. Um, and this is just a bit of a nod to the biodiversity loss that our forests and other natural areas are, are undergoing. And then on the right, you can see another piece uh, this is a big project that I've been working on, and this is uh, collecting recyclable and single-use plastics from uh, people around Calgary and, and beyond, um, and I'm turning them into this 
huge bloom of jellyfish sculptures. So this has been installed in a couple of places. Um, and also I've been taking photographs of them using uh, another really old photographic process. These are cyanotypes and these are made just by putting those sculptures down on this uh, sensitized piece of paper and they go out in the sun and that's what takes the photograph. So there are a couple of things that um, that really set me on the path to making the kind of art that uh, that I make now. In 2015, I took part in an artist residency um, near Ottawa called biophilia, which means a desire or tendency to commune with nature. Uh, so I spent a week there surrounded by artists who are all interested in the intersection of art and science. We went on field trips and met all kinds of scientists and this experience really opened my eyes to all the possibilities of collaboration between artists and researchers. So here you can see a shot of an x-ray that we got to see at a wildlife rescue center. Uh, in the middle, you can see us, uh, we're going for a walk with uh, an expert on edible and medicinal plants. And there on the right, you can see some of the artists working away on um, a moss installation piece in the forest. <clears throat> then in 2017, I got my first art grant. Yay! <laughs> uh, so I got a micro grant from Calgary Arts Development. Uh, it was called the Small Experiments Grant. And the idea of this was that you could try something that was really different and see how it might change the way that you worked, how it could revolutionize your art practice. So, um, so I got $5,000, I built that tiny teardrop trailer that Kathleen mentioned in the intro, the Alfresco science machine, except when you're writing a grant, you have to have a very important sounding name. So for grant purposes, it's called the Mobile Natural History Collection Laboratory. So, I built the camper, which is my combination for living in the workspace, and I got to take it on the road for three weeks. Um, I stopped, started in Calgary and worked my way out to Pacific Rim National Park, stopping at all kinds of lovely places on the way, um, gathering materials for what would be the first pieces in this um, ongoing body of work, which is kind of my main. Uh, my main work. <clears throat> so this is when I started making work using a scanner as a camera. And I was just so amazed and excited at the detail that I could capture in the process. My very favorite part of making these is when the scan pops up on the computer and I can just like zoom in and in and in and in um, and just get an amazingly close look at everything that's, that's in the image. <clears throat> Uh, since I was little, I've always been drawn to things that are miniature and it's no different now. <laughs> so uh, the things that I'm really interested in sharing in my work are all the tiny little things, mosses, lichens, fungi, all those tiny little sprouts and things that, that often go overlooked when uh, regular people <laughs> go out for a walk in the forest. <clears throat> so I think... Um, when I make these now, I sort of think of them as portraits of ecosystems. So this, this one, for example, was made at that uh, residency, the Empire of Dirt, which is a really wonderful place in Creston, BC. Um, so I've spent a lot of time there. And this is basically a picture of the forest there, kind of pulled through all the different cones of the trees that live there. Um, and when you see this as a huge print, you can actually see each little cone and all the lichens that are growing on it and the mosses that are growing on it. It's a really cool experience. Uh, this is another one from Empire of Dirt. These are everybody's favorite magical looking Amanita mushrooms. This is a fancy little subspecies that has a yellow cap unlike the usual red. Uh, this is from up in Northern Alberta. And there's all sorts of lovely little odds and ends in there, fish scale and lichen and bird egg. And one of my favorite lichens called fairy puke. 
again, this is just all these tiny little mosses and ferns that are just, just starting to sprout. And this last one is from Pacific Grim, uh, where I don't know if anybody else does this, but I can spend about eight hours a day just wandering around looking at those beautiful sort of curlicues of seaweed and seagrass that wash up on the beach. And so this is my, my interpretation of that. <clears throat> So earlier I was saying that I'm really interested in thinking about the human impact on uh, the natural world. So as I thought about this idea more and more, it sort of occurred to me, why not literally show how we're implicated by including, um, by including my own hands? Uh, also acknowledging, of course, that I'm definitely part of the problem. I'm part of human society. I'm not uh, exempt at all. Um, so this was just a way of thinking a little bit more critically about those ideas. So we'll kind of come back to these things a bit later when I get to the birds as well. So birds, back to birds. They became a much bigger part of my imagination when I went back to Ottawa to do a second residency with the same group as before. Uh, this one is called Parliament of Owls. Uh, so it was all about artists who are making work about birds. So again, we got to go to some really amazing places and meet some just uh, exceptionally knowledgeable people. And so this is one of the places we went. This is the archives of the Canadian Museum of Nature. And we got to spend an afternoon there peeking into all these cabinets. Uh, so you see on the left, there's a big collection of hummingbirds. Um, and they've been collected over so many years. I can see one tag right now that says 1931, uh, another one 1975, 1965. So they have a huge collection of birds that range um, quite extensively over time. And then in the middle, you can see a cabinet full of owls. And on the right, um, some of you might recognize, this is a bird called the ivory-billed woodpecker, which is almost certainly extinct. Um, and it's also called the Lord God bird because it's so striking and large that when people would see it, they would say, Lord God. So they got see some of those too. <clears throat> and then just because who doesn't get obsessed with all these specimens in the museums, here's another <laughs> few snaps. We got to see lots of nests and again, bird eggs that had been collected over many, many decades in many places. And birds from all over the world, really. <clears throat> uh, and one of the most interesting, I thought, field trips that we got to go on was we got to go on a morning survey with the folks at Safe Wings in Ottawa. Um, so they're, if you haven't heard of them, they're a group that does uh, similar, similar work to um, CMSRT. And so we got to go out with them one morning while they were serving downtown Ottawa looking for um, birds to rescue that had struck the windows. And here you can see the group um, looking at one of the sort of problem buildings that we stopped at. And uh, by the time, by the time the walk was over, I was on my phone already sort of Googling to see if there was a similar group in Calgary. And uh, it just so happened that this is pretty much right when Kathleen, you were getting started. So I found you almost right away. <laughs> So eventually I was able to connect with Kathleen um, and the rest of the gang. And so we got ourselves organized so that I could get started. And as Kathleen said, camped out in her garage for hours at a time, uh, working on this project that I'm calling Birding in the Anthropocene. Uh, so I mentioned earlier that I'm using a scanner to do my work. Um, so it's a very high resolution flatbed scanner. It's meant for scanning tiny little photo negatives. <clears throat> so you can imagine if you're scanning something like that that you want to make a print out of, 
that scanner is gathering a lot of detail. So that's what I'm using as a, as a camera. And it has a similar effect with all the, the things that I collect and scan, including the birds. So I spent a few weeks in Kathleen's garage this summer scanning all the deceased birds that had been collected during uh, two survey seasons, which was fall 2020 and spring 2021. Um, it was really interesting. Before I started, I was actually, I was kind of apprehensive, even though it's, it's kind of a cliche at this point that artists are always like collecting dead things. Um, I have a lot of bones and skulls and antlers and stuff in my collection, but I don't think I'd ever really handled a, a bird. Um, so it was a, an interesting experience to get to work with them. And I don't know if you've ever held a bird, but the first one that I picked up, it was just so light. Um, and of course it makes perfect sense because um, their bones are hollow and so light so that they can perform this magical act of flying, just leaping into the air. So they have to be very light, but um, holding those little birds really gives you very profound sense of just how fragile they are. So um, when you kind of think about these poor little birds hitting the windows, it's it's really reinforced by that feather feather weight. <clears throat> uh, so the project is still is still ongoing. I'm um, certainly still going to be continuing to document the birds, um, but it's got a couple of pieces to it. So one of the first things that um, that we created was this aggregation of all of the scans. Um, there's um, most years, uh, there's an organization in Toronto called FLAP, and they do this big, they do the same work um, as our group, and they, they collect all the birds that were collected during a year, and they put on this event where they rent a huge ballroom, and all the birds get laid out in this room. Um, and because they're on a different visitor flyway, the number of birds is much higher than here, luckily for us. Um, but it's just uh, such a striking thing to see this huge room, basically carpeted with little birds that are all window strike um, victims. So during COVID, of course, a lot of these in-person events weren't going on. So instead they put on an online event and we put together a video that was our contribution to that event called, uh, the event was called When Worlds Collide. Um, so I'll just show you the video. It's just uh, about two and a half minutes long. And it was just um, an attempt to sort of create that same effect as the layout would. So, and it had quite an effect on me too. When I was working with the birds, I would usually just have one out at a time. So take it out get out of its little bag, scan it, make a few notes and put it back. So I only ever really had one at a time. So even for me to put it together and see them all, um, all sort of lined up like this was um, kind, of, kind of surprising and sad. So um, I'll just start the movie. Like I said, it's just about two and a half minutes. So. And I, I don't think there's sound either, is there, Julia, just so people know. Right, yeah, no sound.
you did such a beautiful job with that, Julia. And I, and just so folks know um, that piece, and I think you were explaining that before, but that was added on to a larger event presented by Field Light Awareness Programming in Toronto. And, uh, and Marissa's looking for the link to share you, um, share with you the, the whole video uh, to watch Julia's work incorporated into that. Awesome. And she's Thank already you. got it in the chat. Yeah. You're the best team. Amazing. Amazing. Okay. Just a reminder if anybody has questions to um, to let us know. I know it's gonna be it can be very hard to see deceased birds, but just know that none of these are suffering. These ones have passed when we found them and yeah. Thank you. A good point. <clears throat> so um, now I'll go through and just uh, we'll just stay with a couple of the images a little bit longer. Um, I am a great collector of interesting facts about all the things that I study. Um, and birds uh, are absolutely no different than anything else. So um, I have a few interesting facts that I'll read to you about each of these birds. And these are all from the Cornell Lab site, All About Birds, which is a really, really awesome resource and that's another one I can put that in the chat afterwards but um, they're just really wonderful there's so much to discover there so um, these are all directly quoting from Cornell <clears throat> so this is an oven bird uh, extensive uninterrupted forest with relatively closed canopies 50 to 70 feet above the ground seem ideal even fairly large forest patches of 250 to 2,000 acres may not be able to support ovenbird populations unless larger forests are close by. Its nest, a leaf covered dome resembling an old fashioned outdoor oven, gives the ovenbird its name. Ovenbirds migrate with storm fronts on their spring and fall migration routes. Large numbers are sometimes killed as they collide with towers and tall buildings along the path of these fronts. This is a white-throated sparrow. And I think my favorite part of the description of these is when they talk about their nests. And these are, these are a forest sparrow, white-throated sparrows. <clears throat> The female builds the nest mostly in the morning. She finds a depression in the ground and builds it up with pieces of moss. Next, she builds the nest walls using grass, twigs, wood chips, pine needles. She then makes a lining of fine grasses, rootlets, and deer hair. The nest is typically concealed from above by leaves and visible from only one side. White-throated sparrows don't reuse their nests. The eggs are very pale blue or greenish blue, speckled with purplish, chestnut, and lilac. The oldest recorded white-throated sparrow was at least 14 years and 11 months old when it was recaptured and re-released during banding operations in Alberta. This is a yellow-rumped warbler. These birds eat mainly insects in the summer and switch to berries in the winter, including juniper, poison ivy, poison oak, grapes, as well as bayberry and wax myrtle, which have a waxy coating that only these warblers can digest. They sometimes form huge flocks when berry picking. And if another bird gets too close, they indicate the infraction by holding the body horizontally, fanning the tail and raising it to form a right angle with its body. Migrating yellow rumped warblers, like many migrants, are frequently killed in collisions with radio towers, buildings, and other obstructions. And this is the musical act. This is the red-eyed vireo. Each male sings 30 or more different songs, and neighbors have unique repertoires. Over 12,500 different red-eyed vireo song types have been recorded. On May 27th, 1952, 
Louise de Kirillin Lawrence recounted uh, the number of songs sung by a single red-eyed vireo seeking a mate on his territory, 180 miles north of Toronto. He sang 22,197 songs in the 14 hours from just before dawn to evening, singing for 10 of these hours. The female spends four to five days constructing a nest of bark strips, grasses, pine needles, wasp nest paper, twigs, and plant fibers that hangs below the branch. She glues the materials, some of which are provided by the male, together and to the branch fork with spider web adhesive, occasionally supplemented with spider egg cases and sticky plant fibers. These birds are sensitive to disturbance such as clear cut logging, strip mining and forest fragmentation. Like many nocturnal migrants, red eyed vireos are killed in collisions with buildings and other tall structures, sometimes in large numbers. And this one, you can actually see if you look closely, you can see the little dent on his beak. Red breasted nuthatch. Their calls sound like tiny tin horns being honked in the treetops. Nuthatches are among the few non woodpeckers that excavate their own nest cavities from solid wood. Female red-breasted nuthatches usually choose the nest site, though males without mates may begin excavating several cavities at once in an attempt to attract a female. Once they've excavated the cavity, the female builds a bed of grass, bark strips, and pine needles and lines it with fur, feathers, fine grasses, and shredded bark. Both males and females apply conifer resin to the entrance, sometimes ap applying it with a piece of bark a remarkable example of tool use. So now um, I was talking about the detail earlier. So now I'll show a few detail photos um, so we can take a look at some of these a little bit closer up and see some of the really neat little bits. Uh, so this is a palm warbler. About 98% of all palm warblers breed in the vast boreal forest of Canada. This remote region is vulnerable to extractive industries such as peat harvesting, oil development, and logging, and in the long term to climate change. Palm warblers are also one of the most frequently killed species at lighted towers across the United States. A TV tower in Florida has caused the death of more than 1,800 palm warblers during a 25-year period. And this is a ruby crowned kinglet. <clears throat> this one, you can see all the little whiskers around the beak and that's a, an attribute usually of an insect eater because it kind of helps pull them into the beak as they're chasing them. The ruby crowned kinglet is a tiny bird that lays a very large clutch of eggs. There can be up to 12 in a single nest. Although the eggs themselves weigh only about a 50th of an ounce, an entire clutch can weigh as much as the female herself. Ruby crowned kinglets make their globe shaped nests in trees, occasionally as high up as 100 feet, using grasses, feathers, mosses, spider webs, and cocoon silk for the outer structure, fine plant material and fur for the inner lining. Even though they're tiny birds seemingly overflowing with energy, metabolic studies on ruby crown kinglets suggest that these tiny birds use only about 10 calories per day. <laughs> ruby crown kinglets use their long, bubbly, and amazingly loud songs to establish territories. It's more energy efficient than chasing and less dangerous than fighting. And this amazing beauty is a sparrow, um, just a sparrow, a Lincoln sparrow. Um, this one also has a lovely description from Cornell. The dainty Lincoln sparrow has a talent for concealing itself. It sneaks around the ground amid willow thickets in wet meadows, rarely straying from cover. 
When it decides to pop up and sing from a willow twig, its sweet jumbling sound is more fitting of a house wren than a sparrow. Though its song might conceal its sparrowness, its plumage says otherwise. This sparrow looks as if it's wearing a finely tailored suit with a buffy mustachial stripe and delicate streaking down its buffy chest and sides. Once on the nest, the female is especially secretive. When disturbed, she slips quietly off the nest and runs mouse-like with head down through the vegetation for several feet before flying up off the ground. Like virtually all migrant songbirds, Lincoln sparrows are vulnerable to collisions with structures such as TV towers and buildings. This is an orange crowned warbler. The male orange crowned warbler song is far more variable than that of other wood warblers. So much so that the males can be told apart by their distinctive song patterns. Breeding males often form song neighborhoods where two to six birds in adjacent territories learn and mimic each other's songs. These neighborhood songs can persist for years. Orange crown warblers eat mainly invertebrate prey, including ants, beetles, spiders, flies, and caterpillars. They supplement their insect diet with fruit, various seeds, and plant gulls, and are common visitors at the sap wells drilled by sap suckers and other woodpeckers. These warblers also pierce the base of flowers to get the nectar. One cause of orange crowned warbler mortality includes collisions with airport towers, TV towers, <clears throat> and wind turbines. And the last one, I just wanted to come back to that red breasted nuthatch that I showed you before, um, just so you can get a look at those amazing feet. This is one of my favorite parts of these birds. <clears throat> and then this last slide is just uh, what I was mentioning earlier, a little bit of a side branch of this project. Um, but again, including that idea of the human element um, to talk about this issue. <clears throat> I find them particularly evocative. I think they give you a real sense of scale of just how tiny these birds are. Um, but also, of course, allude to the really sad fact, which is that our, all of these birds died because of human, human causes. <clears throat> um, and some of them, the hand is holding the bird uh, very softly and tenderly, but in other ones, um, there's something a little bit more unsettling maybe that might make you look again and think again. <clears throat> but there are so many groups um, like ours and all over Canada and the US that are doing a lot of really good work and uh, working really hard to make some changes um, just on an individual level, but also a government level and working with buildings. So. Um, at least, at least we have that. There's, there's some hope on the horizon. So, um, and that uh, brings me to the end of my presentation. So, I guess we can open it up to your questions. I'm not usually speechless. As anybody who knows me for more than three seconds can attest to, the way that you presented those birds, Julia, was absolutely heartwarming. It really, you really allowed us to, I think, reflect on each of them being a lot more than just a bird and remembering that that bird's already gone through, you know, uh, its mating rituals, built a few nests over a few years, traveled back and forth across the continent. It's got its own stories and then it just meets a window. Yeah. Yeah, that's been uh, probably one of the most interesting parts of not just the bird work, but all of the work that I do is that opportunity to learn about, like I call them in my other work, I call them charismatic microflora, because people always talk about charismatic megafauna that everyone gets excited about, like elephants, giraffes, panda bears. Um, but there's also something really 
it, it is really charismatic about all these tiny little things too. And all, and, and again, hats off to Cornell because they do such a beautiful job of um, sharing the life histories and that little bit of personality that, that these birds have, which if anyone has watched birds for any length of time, you, you definitely get that sense. So. I wonder, we do have a couple of questions there. Before we go to the questions, um, I think it was Gary that had commented about if you zoom in and look at the detail. And I'm just wondering, are you able to go to one or two of them and just zoom, zoom in even a little bit more for us, please, to just show us what you're able to get in on there? Because um, it is quite incredible. Yeah. And while you're... Oh yeah, see there's the, there's the original stuff. Um, you've got some well, really nice compliments here too on your presentation. You. So I will, I'll just pull up a, an image here so that I can zoom and zoom and zoom. Thank you. Maybe while you're doing that too, there was a question about how you get the black background or how it is that your images all have the black background. And yep. I remember this exact question being asked in a very chilly little garage <laughs> and like a five-year-old that stared over your shoulder to watch how you did everything. You were very patient, so. Yeah, no, everyone's always really interested because it's such a striking feature um, of all these images. So um, it is, uh, it's kind of an artifact of the scanning process. Um, if you leave the lid open, it uh, just lets that background fall off to black because the light doesn't travel very far. So um, when I when I started, I, I mean, now I, I sort of have a better sense of how the process works. So I have like this nice sort of flat black uh, foil kind of tent thing that I set up over it um, just to cut down on on any variation in the background, but um, it's pretty close to, to how it just comes out if you if you pop some stuff on there and, and let the let the scanner do its work. And one thing I found very interesting too along that line is how long it takes to scan each of them. Yeah. So with one of those typical sized birds, which you could see in Julia's hand are not very big. How long would that, once you've placed it, because um, I know, so you take a lot of care with how you're positioning it and you might try a couple of different sides and um, yeah. try to capture the story of that bird. But once it's on the glass, how long does that take to actually move through and, and capture the, the image in your, um, on your computer? Yeah, it does. You're right. It takes quite a while because again, that's coming back to that level of detail that it's collecting. So um, it takes, I'm able to run a quick sort of preview scan just to get a quick look at, um, at what the image is going to look like. But to do a final scan of a little bird that's maybe two to three inches tall or um, might take about 20 minutes. So it's quite, quite long because it's just that the lens just traveling very slowly uh, along the glass taking that, taking that picture. So you really have to build your patience. Yes. <laughs> or sit somewhere that's really like beautiful to sit and observe, like in on a beach <laughs> or in a garage. Yes, exactly. Both very inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> I actually One. wind up spending most of the time looking at whatever I had just finished scanning. So oh, I guess, hey. I'll, yeah, I'll look at, I'll just spend that time gazing at, you know, the last bird while I wait for the next one. Yeah, that makes sense. I'll just check here. Yeah. And if you have questions, you're welcome to unmute as well. Oh, and do we've got the oven bird there. So this is the oven bird again. I'm not sure how this is showing up on the it's screen. It's actually Probably better if I just make it bigger. Wow. It's, it's pretty clear. Especially if you look up in the upper left-hand corner at the white and black feathers, it really it helps you to see how clear and detailed that is. Little bits of dust and 
and you can see the structure of the feather. And if Anne was here, she she's been studying up on that. She could have told us the all of the names, the parts of the feathers. But that's that's incredible. So I think you have this impression of the bird having, you know, distinct little feathers. But when you see them like this, it's almost like I don't know, it's just so different than what what you imagine it before seen it yeah. like this unless it's just me but um no it's true I think I think we look at them and you you see it as being a lot smoother but once you get to this sort of scale you can see all the little spaces that I mean this is what keeps them warm first of all so you can now you can see all the space in there that would trap warm air but yeah you can just kind of get get lost looking at all these little details. Amazing. When you were doing this with um, the birds that were in the freezer, were there any, once you zoomed in and saw them, because I know sometimes with macro photography, you take a picture of, a, of what you think is just a flower and then you zoom in and one of my favorite things is to find a cute little face poking out that's an aphid or something and and I love aphids forever now because of it and yeah. um did you have anything like that with the birds where you zoomed in you're like oh did not see that coming I don't know if I uh, want to know your answer actually but no I didn't not with these ones okay. I don't uh, yeah I think because these ones get collected on a survey pretty quickly and into a freezer there's not a lot of time for a lot of life forms other life forms to sort of move in and get established so not really I think for for me with the birds it happens with a lot of other stuff like if I'm scanning mushrooms there's definitely a lot of stuff that drops onto the glass and starts creeping around um, oh, wow but, <laughs> but yeah not wow. so much with the birds with the birds it was more things like uh, just being able to see their feet at that uh, level of magnification was fascinating. I mean, yeah. they're, they're tiny little birds. They're usually flittering all over the place and you can't, you know, you yeah. can't get a good look at them. Or those, Even, all the little whiskers on the beaks of all the insectivores, suddenly you're like, oh, that's. That's you know. fascinating. And the little feet, like the, I think one of the first ones that you showed with the, the feet, you could see little tiny pads and, yeah. and very dinosaur like very dinosaur yeah. like yeah yeah or like the little feathers around the eyes they're like yeah. eyelashes so they're, they're just like tiny <laughs> now that you're saying that do you have one of those handy preferably one that has the eyeballs in it still <laughs> i know that yeah that one, sorry no don't be sorry that is <laughs> So when, when the birds hit the windows, they um, the eye. oftentimes they, if they do fall under a bush or something, they may not be seen for a couple of days. And of course, as part of nature, they start being taken back into the ground. And um, but usually they're they're fully intact when we find them. Look, and there's the okay. whiskers around the. Yeah. the there's uh, the whiskers. The there's nostril. the little broken beak okay warning here comes the eye it's kind of gross Luckily, okay warning on the eye warning, <laughs> warning. But like you have an eye coming up <laughs> look at the tiny those tiny little feathers around the eye. look at that like, and the eyes turn white in uh birds once they've passed um and they've been in the freezer i don't recall what the explanation behind that is but they do do you turn white which is a little bit haunting when you yeah I was gonna say when you first see that I still find it quite haunting but yeah. I think that's a little bit you see that happening there yeah, yeah. I'm glad I made you laugh Kate uh, Kate is one of our <laughs> downtown surveyors and uh, I'm glad you had a good laugh because usually it's uh, Kate Kate was one of the ones who'd love to text me at five in the morning and say <gasps> I have a find and it would be like a baked potato randomly found on a street or a <laughs> used to find odd food items downtown Calgary. So uh, I'm glad you got to make me, I mean, we made you laugh because uh, you've made me laugh a ton. 
Hi from Treaty 6. Oh, wonderful. And Treaty 3. Fantastic. Fantastic. It's so great to have you here. Um, let me just see. And Marissa, if you've spotted questions, feel free to. There's quite a few comments. Let's see, and you're also welcome to unmute and chat too. That is more than welcome. It's kind of the nice thing about having a smaller group. Yeah, and so Jessica, yeah, you got that answer. There's no velvet laid over top of what goes on the scanner. It's just how it naturally works out. And um, and yeah, the, the full flat video is there. And so as I mentioned, in case you missed it, when there's a link in the chat, it's a good idea to click on it and open it in another window and just leave it there until later because you probably won't be able to copy and paste it from the, the comments and then you end up losing the, the great uh, links that are there. And the yeah. element of the dead birds remind me of images of Darwin specimens. Interesting to contemplate how people use animals and their bodies. And that's so true, Helen. Um, is that your mom? That's my sister. That's your sister? Your sister's here too. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she's, okay. a, she's a writer and an artist too. So we always, uh, we always try to attend each other's uh, talks. And I meetings. remember you saying that because she did a project on glass yeah. recently. Yes, right? exactly. Mm, I heard about you, exactly. Helen. We all need to talk. My adopted sister, Donna, is here with us. She's, she doesn't know that I've adopted her, but she she's adopted <laughs> into our family. Um, yeah, and the Darwin specimens is very interesting. Um, I noticed with your when you went out to Ottawa to the the museum there, you said it was the Canadian Museum of Nature, and yeah. there were the the hummingbirds down along the left, and some of the oldest dates I could see were like nineteen sixty three or you know, 1975, and, and they don't refrigerate them either, I don't think. I think they're dry stored. They're yeah, ginormous. those are, they just call them, uh, they're bird skins. They're skins. Um, so when they're in the museum, yeah, it's just a stuffed skin. Exactly. <clears throat> they also have white eyes. They're just like with little stuffed bits of cotton poking out. <laughs> That's right. That's right too. And and so when we collect the, the birds that we see downtown, they are like everything, just so people know, if you see feathers or something, um, you're best not to pick them up because most feathers, most most anything connected to a bird is actually protected by law. And you would need to have a wildlife permit from your province and or from the federal government, depending upon what you're doing and what you're picking up. And so um, with the work that we do, we've always had wildlife permits. And up until recently, it was always with uh, Dr. Scott Level at St. Mary's University. Um, was kind enough to keep our permits for us and 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 they through the university there would do quite a few of the skins and, and he was explaining that they they last like decades like that to be able to learn from and so I it really caught my eye that you had the hummingbirds there so a lot of the birds that were collected downtown over the last couple of years now will be in a, in a position like that and we do always try to find so we always try to treat them really respectfully. Um, it was one of the first things that we did was to, you know, acknowledge that we're we're picking up animals that are likely sacred to someone, and you know, to be very mindful of that. And it's so we just try to treat them all as respectfully as possible. Which I love how you've, you know, really kind of given them life in a different way in the way that you do your work and how you express the descriptions of the birds too. And we also hope that they don't die in vain and that they'll teach others more about them to hopefully prevent the deaths of more birds. Um, or if there is anything else that can be learned from them, um, different, you know, potentially different studies, things like that. So because they're already gone, um, hopefully we can teach with them or learn something from them. So um, let's see. Yeah, because and just to pick up on that, I mean mm -hmm. the the whole the whole point of having a group like this. Well, not the whole point, but one one of the really important things that a group like this does is document that um, these things that are happening. Until I think until groups um, started recording these, they probably just got swept up or taken away by scavengers, and nobody really understood the extent mm -hmm. of the problem. So. 
um, collecting them and counting them, recording them, and you know, putting them into scientific collections um, adds a lot to our knowledge of, of how we're affecting uh, all these different species. So, kind of bearing witness to them in a way. I don't know if it's odd yeah. to say that, but I kind of feel yeah. like that in a way, right? Because um, yeah. through no fault of the caretakers at buildings are just doing their jobs, but that is their job they clean up the sidewalk and so we have seen we've been present at buildings when um uh one day dan arndt and i were downtown and and he had just rescued one that had just struck the building it was actually i believe they were white throat sparrows there were two of them we could hear and as we were talking we were we could hear them singing <clears throat> and we continued to talk and then while we were talking one hit the window and he rescued that one and while we were talking about well, who will be taking it to the vet and, and getting ourselves organized. We saw the cleaners were standing where we just were, and they just swept one up and put it in the garbage and went over and asked them to pull it out. And they were really nice. Like they, they weren't trying to do anything wrong. Yeah. Um, but, you know, in speaking to Flap in Toronto, it can happen where they get swept up and thrown away without you know, giving them a chance to recover. And um, but this one was deceased. So I don't mean to alarm anybody. <laughs> I think they're careful, but you just don't know. And so it was nice to be able to be there and see and then we could collect that bird and make sure that it was gone and it was and then rescue the other one. <clears throat> and I think actually, you had the one that was deceased. I think you had it in your show here. Yeah, probably. Yeah. Um, yeah. I see a comment. Uh, the scan art was incredible and well done. Uh, the uh, is it AB's grandest print? Mm -hmm. was That's the pine. The well, the cones, all the different cones. <gasps> yes, yeah, love that. And that, yeah, it's Chase. That's um, yeah, that I love that one too. I'd love to see that in big. Have you printed that huge? Yes, I have. It's Where? about. Or five feet tall. <laughs> so any of them, I show my work in Calgary at Christine's class and gallery. Um, and I don't have them up on show right at the moment, but she's always happy to open the drawers up and let people take a look. So I'll put a link to that gallery in the chat too. If you want to go by for a visit. Um, yeah, they're, they're really something to experience at that scale. And I think it'll be the same with the birds. I haven't made any prints of the birds yet, but to be able to take, because I can make them huge. So to take a mm -hmm. ruby crowned kinglet that is a couple of inches tall and make an image of it where it's bigger than a human uh, is a really interesting way of kind of shaking people's sense of scale and um, yeah, an yeah. interesting experience. <laughs> that does make sense. So the Ruby Crown Kinglet um, and the experts. I am not the expert. I've learned a ton since starting this, but if the experts hear me be incorrect, go ahead and correct me. And my feelings will not be hurt. But if I'm recalling correctly, the Ruby Crown Kinglet is actually just slightly heavier than a heavy bird. Like they're tiny, tiny. And so when you were handling the one that you had here, I think there might have been two actually, if not three. Yeah, there were a couple. Yeah. There were a couple. And, um, beautiful little things because they actually they will um you know display the, their crown of, of feathers so when you see them when they're just relaxed you may not realize but then they if you um, have it in your hand you blow on the feathers that you can see this display of color under the feathers just incredible and they're just light as a penny they're just teeny teeny tiny um let's see Bristles are the feathers, I believe. Ah, so we have a discussion here going on about the about the feathers and um, birds. And Jessica, you are oh, you're in Peterborough, and it's ten p.m. Eleven now. She's still on. She may have gone to bed. Oh, you are there. There you are. Welcome. And I wish I could pronounce it. No, I'm not going to try because I don't want to disrespect it. What a beautiful name. Let's see. Okay, we've got all the birds there. So Helen's asking the images of the little birds feel so mournful, and they really do. What do you think the relationship of that emotion is to conservation? What a great question. 
good question. Um, oh, it's hard to work in this field these days and not feel like I, I feel like anyone working in this sort of area is probably going on this pendulum ride back and forth constantly. Um, and I'm no different between hope and just utter dread and horror for what's happening. So I think while I have a hopeful aspect to all this work, which is that I hope that people will see it and be moved to make changes or push for changes at a higher level. I'm also very cynical about the whole thing because I feel like really all I'm doing is documenting all of these things that are just disappearing and it's too late. Um, we've destroyed too many forests, we've messed up too many places. Um, and you heard in almost every one of those bird descriptions, um, they're all, they all just get wiped out by these things that we build. So I think it's a big, it's a big part of making the work is kind of trying to um, process that, that deep disappointment with, uh, with people, mm -hmm. <laughs> including myself. Again, I'm not, you know, I drive a car. I, you know, I do all the things that everybody else does. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it's, it's hard. I think it's hard to be in this time. You, you when you read about birds, for example, uh, and how it used to be 100 years ago, or 200 years ago, with the you hear about Audubon going to collect birds to do his work and he would have teams of people who would go out and they would they would be wading through just like piles of birds that didn't know what to think of them because they'd never seen you know they hadn't really seen people before and they weren't afraid of people and so they were just like picking up specimens left right and center and clubbing them and but you know, you hear about the passenger pigeon flocks that would blot out the sun for days at a time because they were so huge. Um, and I will never get to experience that. We've, we've affected the, the number of birds so deeply that we'll, we'll never experience that volume of birds or insects or trees or Mm -hmm. whales fish any of those things um mm -hmm. that that used to be around so it's it is sad work to be doing it is i hope that i hope that people see the stuff and you know tread a little more carefully but um yeah i think it's just a catalog of of disappearing disappearing things sadly so yeah and i think i think for because this is a great question there's a lot of um <sighs> compassion fatigue that people can feel in working in this kind of uh, field. So I think that one thing that um, we do to try to make sure we, we find hope, because you can get angry. That's a pretty normal reaction. Get pretty mad. Um, but then on the other hand, it's like, well, a lot of people don't realize that their buildings are hurting birds. And so um, I find a lot of hope in that you know, people will react quite quickly. For example, one of the buildings that we found um, had a bit of a physical trap on it. And um, and so when we reached out to them, you know, they made efforts right away and their team came down and showed off what they had done to fix this particular spot. And, and you know, and seeing things like that, it's like, I think people really do care. And I do feel like with efforts like yours, where, where you're drawing that emotion out to make, each of those birds relevant, I think will make a difference. And, and I think that nature is very resilient if we give it a chance to bounce back. So I think with efforts like yours and our team, like, you know, Kate, who's, um, she does help with the birds. She doesn't just make me laugh with food items she finds in the street. Just want to make sure that's clear. And, um, and actually one of our first pictures we took on survey, uh, in if you've ever seen us on the news or anything, there's always a picture of Kate on a, a sidewalk picking up an American Red Start, which I, until that moment, didn't even know they existed. I didn't know what an American Red Start was. If you don't know what an American Red Start is, I would suggest Googling it because they're incredible. And so for a lot of us too, that's how we learn about these birds is 
finding them under a building the first time, which is really kind of crummy. And then you feel incredibly honored to have this incredible bird in your hand. Like who gets to hold an American Red Start? And, you know, and then from that, to see beautiful art like yours coming from it and full circle around to people wanting to make a difference, like marking, going home and marking their glass and making sure that no birds are going to hit their windows at least, right? Because then you look at what is in our control. I can mark my glass. I can talk to my office, um, clean my feeders and things like that. And yeah. Yeah. So, and there have do- been, I mean, that's, you know, one thing that we've seen come out of COVID, for example, is that people were home so much more and were horrified to find just how many birds were hitting their windows. So I think uh, just that was actually a, a really valuable um, experience for people to have because suddenly uh, it opened their eyes to, to the fact that that problem existed at all because otherwise nobody ever noticed. So that's, uh, so that's good. And I think it prompted a lot of people to make changes. You know, I think you probably noticed an uptick in requests for what to do and how to fix the problem. And mm. people, people have become a lot more receptive about, uh, about how to fix it. So, and I mean, doing this work, you can't help but get connected with people who really are making like a giant difference. Like I think of some people that I'm following on Twitter who are just constantly sharing information, but in a, in a very, useful way not just kind of like scold 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 but like here's an amazing thing you can do isn't this fun and exciting so there's yeah. there's definitely hope there's a lot of people who are who are for sure making a making a change so oh that's yeah. amazing and one of the, i think one of the most hopeful things that happened this year that i thought was just really cool if you've heard of men in kilts who do window washing so it's a national company in fact i think they're in the states as well but they're owned in um uh, in smaller, um, what do they call them? Um, franchises, like franchises, right? Yeah. And so the Calgary franchise, when we approached them and we said, you know, you, you feel like you could say this a hundred times to people and not, not be heard. But when we approached men and killed and we said, you know, people want to mark their windows, they care, they just don't know how to, or we don't have time to, and a lot of people should not be on a ladder. I shouldn't be on a ladder because I'm a klutz. Um, and, and so there's, there's folks that want to mark their windows, but they don't necessarily know how or don't have the time. And so there's a gap. And so we don't know who to send people to for help to put the product on their windows. Well, I asked many kids a really busy time in their year. And so they had said, well, we'll have to talk about after this season's done because they don't just own the business, they're out there actually washing the windows and cleaning, like, you know, they're, they're busy physically. They're out Um, there wearing the kilts. They are, (laughs) but no peeking. And they, they are. And so they, but you know what? They came through and they ended up sitting on calls with Feather Friendly in uh, Ontario, who, who create the, the dots and the markings for the glass. They trained their staff, they got test product, they installed it at their office to try it out and tear it down and put it on my house. And we looked at it and we're like, it's different. It's a little bit crooked the first time. And we're all like, he's like, I, yeah, I know. I'm really sorry. And it was in the wind. It was our very first time. Uh, and, and it was literally a practice window. So just for the record, that was a practice window. And I told them, I don't care if it's crooked, just have fun. And so, but it was amazing because then they rolled out an actual project to the public and took, did quotes and came out and did the official installation and they came and installed on the the front side of my home and they two young fellows who they've been trained up this is their thing they do other things of course too but but they were really dedicated to it and you know what i'll I'll dare you to try to find a crooked dot not the dots can be crooked but if there's two in a row you know what i mean and it's it's beautiful and they were so proud and i it just so you know people like that are, are stepping up so there's hope to be had absolutely yeah Yeah. they make it easy they make it easy for other people to to do do the right thing so yeah 100 percent i see oh uh laura said oh dear can you show that birdie again please that was at 807 hmm laura which bird 
Could you please describe it? I'm sorry, I talked for so long that now I'm not sure. Is it that one? Maybe, I think we were talking about ruby crowned kinglets. Yeah. I think when that came up, maybe. And Kate, Kate put up the um, American Red Start. That's good. Thank you. Oh, Ruby Karen Kinglet, yeah. Okay. So that's the that's a detail of the Ruby Karen Kinglet. Amazing. Let us know if you have any specific questions on that or if you just want to look at it. That's good too. Yeah. Yeah, Jessica mentioned such a profound observation about environmental mourning and grieving. I believe US-based artist uh, Brendan Blanchet has done work that uses scanners or x-rays of species affected by pollution, contamination, and habitat destruction. Interesting uh, resonances with uh, Julia's work. That is interesting. Yeah, there's a lot of very interesting work out there. I'm going to make a note of that name. Yours is the best, though, of course, Julia. <laughs> wow. <Well. laughs> Thanks, Kathleen. I just say that because your mom is here. <laughs> My adopted sister, Donna, just put her thumbs up. She agrees. She's never wrong. Um, let's see. If I'm missing any questions, do let me know. See Laura. That's amazing. I, I know that I had a couple of questions for you. So like yeah. I'll speak up if you guys do, because I'm sure you're sick of hearing me talk. Um anthropets. Anthro yes. Could you Anthropocene? Thank you. Anthropocene. Yes. <laughs> Could you tell us about that? Again, please, because you described it to us last night in such an interesting yeah. way. Yeah, so it's a, a term that they use, it, it sort of came from geology. So, you know, the different, the Holocene and the, I'm pulling a blank right now on any of the other ones, of course, but um, so they, they describe all these different geological eras. And the one that I'm the most worried about is the Anthropocene, which is this name that some scientists have coined for our era. Um, and because we're talking about geology, it's it, it, the, the critical piece is that it has to sort of make a, a visible signature in the geological record um, to indicate a shift, a big shift. So for example, after there was a huge meteor that hit the earth and uh, wiped out the dinosaurs, for example, that's one shift from one era to another. And there's all sorts of different things you can see in the fossil record that indicate that huge shift. And what scientists and, and other experts are saying now is that we are having, humans are having such a profound effect on the planet that you know, millennia from now we'll be able to see that sort of line uh, where it shifted to a, a sort of human affected planet where humans are having the biggest effect on the planet and uh, the outcomes of all these natural processes. So, and getting back to birds again, one of the funny things that they say that will, will be a signature of this, this shift is the layer of chicken bones on the planet because humans consume chicken in such huge quantities that there'll actually be a layer of, of chicken bones that'll that'll mark the arrival of, of humans as the greatest force on the planet. So super in classy. addition to lots of other horrible things like plastic and all these other things we've invented that will never go away. So, so, we're so the that's era... what the Anthropocene is. Yes. Okay. The era of chicken bones and plastic, which is super classy. Yeah, that's Excellent. Right. Yes, mm. or Capitalocene, I uh, see in the comments. Yeah, there's been there's there's a few different a uh, few different names that have been coined and they're all sort of treating different different aspe aspects of of how we're affecting the planet just just as you say so yeah wow oh, fantastic 
Let's see. Um, and my sister is saying that I, she's pointing out that I make a lot of my art in BC and wondering if the floods, mm -hmm. um, if I see the floods affecting my future work. So I, I mean, I do travel out to BC a lot to work on these things. A lot of the scans of uh, the plants and things that you saw, a lot of those are from BC. So um, it is something really interesting to think about. And lately I've been doing more work on uh, using specimens that that are sort of bearing the mark of maybe climate change or some kind of catastrophic event. So I have some images, for example, that I did this summer when that heat dome happened. Um, and uh, you could just sort of see, it, it seemed like almost overnight, um, everything just dried up and, and became crispy. So I have some images of these dried up plants with the butterflies that that have nothing to nothing to land on now so um wow i'm sure it will affect it it's uh it's interesting to to sort of think about what will be left because a lot of the the places that have been um have been affected by this are places that i i have visited and worked so yeah it'll it will affect it for sure hmm isn't that something? Well, you know what I think I'll do is um, I'll go ahead and I'll I'll just turn off the recording in a moment, and then I'm going to invite everyone to stay and just hang out and chat. Um, but it's so lovely to have you here, Julia. We're really grateful. And as I mentioned earlier, um, your time has been volunteered. Not only do you volunteer doing surveys with us, but you spent a lot of time of your own bringing your equipment over, packing your equipment out, um, just, you know, being on site, right, because all the animals are under permits, so they, they were all scanned right beside where the permits are held, so we all did everything correctly and kept everything in order, and, you know, you're so dedicated, um, and then to come and spend this time with us tonight is, we're really grateful, and I, and I think that that, particularly what's spoke to me was the piece where you were reading out from the, I think it was from the Cornell University, uh, information on each of those species, and you just, yeah, I learned from you. Those are a lot of facts I hadn't heard before, because, you know, you just don't sit and stop anymore and read anymore, as I just haven't had time, but to sort of learn more about those birds that we're picking up is, was really quite stunning, and I think that you really hit that home. So I want to thank you for your role and if you've even reached one person to help them, it matters. Um, and because if each of us do something little, as uh, uh, I love that Marissa corrected me kindly and respectfully once, because one of my very favorite things is the starfish story. And I think I'll mention it quickly because I haven't brought it up for a little while. And I know everybody loves it when I repeat stories. And this is such a great one. But the starfish story, which is technically called a sea star, because as Marissa is quite great, it is a sea star. Then I love the starfish story because it's, a, it's, all, it's when I see starfish, you can think sea star, that's what I mean. And, you know, walking down the beach, um, I, if you've not heard the story before and you need a little bit of hope before uh, we go on to our little coffee break together, I'll just tell you this. Um, the story goes that there is a child walking down the beach and the tide has gone out and all of these uh, starfish are drying in the sun. And so the child is walking along and picks up the starfish and throws it in the water and walks along and picks up a starfish and throws it in the water and is continuing on like this when, of course, an adult comes along and says, hey, you know, what are, what are you doing there? And, uh, and the child's like, well, they're going to die if I don't put them back in the water. And, and they said, well, look at them. There's thousands. There's thousands of them. You're never, you're never going to make a difference. You're never going to just, you know, you know, the look, right? That look gave them that look. And the child picks up the starfish, throws it in the water and says, well, I made a difference for that one. And I think it's just really important to remember that no matter what you do, how big or little, it's going to make a difference. And um, and so just really grateful to have all of you here listening and, um, yeah, and so I'll, I'll turn off the recording and Julia, thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me and thanks everyone for tuning in and listening. I hope we get to meet in the real world soon. Absolutely.